Uh, so I guess this is a question for uh, Rutgers maybe. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you recruit? I mean, uh, we, when we started out, we, um, we got diversity in our program, we wanted more. But what we hit the wall with was staffing and having time to go out and do road trips and things like that. So how did you make that happen? Well, as I was mentioning here, uh, Previously that I had actually um, spent some time, I was a faculty member at Elizabeth City State University, which is an HBCU in North Carolina, so I already had kind of a network. Um, not that it helped as we were talking, because a lot of students, though I knew them, or I knew their faculty, were like, no, I'm not moving there. Um, so that was tough, but no, certainly timing and having staff, because you need that. You need a personal, I think, you need a personal touch to kind of bring kids, especially first generation or kids who are just not accustomed to going away from home to kind of say, it'll be okay, come with me, come check this out. A and that's really tough. The other issue we had is, um, so New Jersey does not have any HBCUs, but we do have s uh, some universities that will call themselves historically minority serving. Um, the designation in the state's a little bit hairy, but we even went to some of those programs but we, you know, we just have Rutgers in the state as the large public, right? We don't have like a UNC, NC State or things like that. Um, and, uh, and then there's a lot of smaller schools and, uh, and the culture of how we teach, how we interact with students is very different as well. And so they've heard rumors like you're going to go to Rutgers, you're going to fail out, things like that. And where self-esteem is already a little bit precarious, now you're going to kind of say, oh, come here. So even in our local constituency, it's been hard sometimes to convince students. And, and when they do get in, we certainly see that some students, I mean, if you, because there's such diversity in the K through 12 preparation system, right? So then they get into various schools or they didn't get into Rutgers originally. Now they're in, you know, in a program that just does a lot of things differently and they haven't had the time to make up some of that distance lost and they're not, I mean, they're fully bright people who are fully aware of this saying, I don't know if I want to <laughs> come to Rutgers, you know, I might, I'm afraid I'm going to fail out or things like that. And so there's been a lot of me talking with students trying to say look okay you're right you know you're you scored lower on the GREs in this area or, or you're right you you know for whatever reason your bio class didn't get that far or you didn't have this kind of research experience because your school didn't offer that or things like that to say come anyway stay anyway you know and and even if you're I mean to be honest how many of us have graduate degrees does anyone I mean how often do they ask you for your transcript that I'm telling them, stay, persist, you know, a and graduate, and you will see the world open up. And, and that it is a real concern, I get it, you know, that we do have students, you know, and, and some of our programs where they like to recruit from certain schools, the students are all prepared the same in our School of Engineering, you know, and it's like, you know, to bring in students from other places and say, okay, you know, even though they all practically know each other, right, Princeton's down the road, we like to just exchange students back and forth, and now it's like, welcome to this cohort of kids that already, you know, kids, are, they're adults, uh, who already know each other, and, uh, and so that has been a challenge, and I've found sometimes just, just getting them to talk about it up front, to say, you know, and I've said to them, why did you say no or you know what's bothering you or what's your hesitation and I do sort of have to chat with them maybe tell some jokes you know have lunch or something to get them to feel relaxed enough to say really it's this you know versus oh it was a lovely program you know and I've had some wonderful students who were like I think it'll just be a little too cold you know a student from an HBCU in Florida and I was like really but you're thinking about going to Chicago you know and she's like <laughs> Well, it's going to also be a little this, you know, she's kind of just going on and I'm like, oh, I bet well, we do more of that here, you know, kind of thing. And then I was like, I suspect you're not telling me something. And she's like, yeah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> and so it was like, OK, so there was I had to push a little bit because people, you know, perfectly lovely people didn't want to say your program seems scary or it seems unfriendly or, you know, when they go and they meet faculty and and they all look a certain way, you know, eat regardless, sometimes even regardless of skin color you know there's something scary about faculty who are all part of you know and so I think I'm usually I'm probably in our team the more sympathetic <laughs> and so I get sent to all these things and so it's usually 
a lot of my time and it is tough to keep up and I have to gear up every year for recruitment and be like oh, I got to be at these places I got to start talking to people in my network and uh, I wish that we could do a, a far better job of it right here intrigued by your uh, mention of uh, mental modeler as a, a concept mapping tool and I was wondering whether you have seen any evidence that using the mapping or the computer as an intermediary uh, decreases tension between communication of people in different disciplines. So, th and I think there's, what I heard from that were sort of two questions, um, and, and because we've done a lot of mapping, a lot of paper-based mapping, and we've done a lot with the uh, digital interface, and the answer isn't exactly the same for both, but um, we actually created the tool based on some work we were doing with uh, public participatory modeling. So our approach is really geared around bringing members of the public to the table and, um, and creating a way of aggregating what it is we know by trying to throw out units, by trying to use very fuzzy mathematics so that it could feel like we're systematically working towards something, but we're not necessarily, you don't necessarily need to have that same level of, of knowledge about when we're talking about you know, air quality points versus something, the dollars in schools, you know, we can kick all those units out and just try to talk about concepts. And so the, the mathematics behind what we do really has a lot to do with when you get more of this, you get more of that. When you get less of this, you get less of that or the reverse, right? And so um, we've had a lot of success with that kind of approach and getting communities and getting members to draw out ideas. We also created the uh, digital tool to help us very quickly aggregate them so that we don't need to take all their individual paper drawn models, bring them back, and then meet them a day later. We can just do that within you know, a half hour. Um, when it comes to different disciplines and academics working together, we almost entirely use the digital tool. And, um, and mostly my, my colleagues seem to like it. Uh, I've used it for interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, my undergraduates love it. The graduate students were the hardest sell um, because they all felt like they had their own way of doing things and why should they have to try to take notes in this way or represent things this way. Um, and so that, so in this program, making sure they all kind of, you know, a lot of them will rip off scraps of paper and hand it to me and it's like, really, you couldn't, you couldn't put this in the digital interface to make my life a little bit easier. Um, and they're like, well, no, I learn best this way or I do it best that way. So for us, it's, they've been our most challenging audience. But in general, I think stripping away the semantics, stripping, because it's very low entry when it comes to a lot of that, and putting ideas on space really does help. I think we've had a lot, and there's a, we've been able to publish quite a bit on why we think cognitively that helps and why we think it from a participatory perspective it's a way to make sure everyone's thoughts end up on the same page. Okay, so this actually touches on something that Rebecca talked about and Laura talked about, but I'm and Lakeisha talked about, and I want your perspective, Lakeisha, on this. So to make none of you feel, I talked all great and lovely, wonderful things. My job is amazing. Iger got me to my job. All of that is completely true. I almost didn't graduate. It was very hard for me dealing with this balance between what my disciplinary silo wanted and expected of me and what the interdisciplinary world and the industry and the path that I was seeing was moving towards. And um, Lakeisha may be reading a little bit between the lines, but I, th I thought I felt kind of the same message from you that this was hard, it was a struggle. Now that I'm on the other end in this environment where this is appreciated, I find it to be 100% worthwhile. And I'm wondering if um, you have ideas on how the path may have been easier for you. How might it have been different so that it wouldn't have been such a struggle to get to where you are? Um, that is accurate reading between the lines. <laughs> it, it was very much a struggle. I think part of it is that we were in the first cohort. So most people didn't understand on our campus what we even were, right? So they didn't even understand what we were supposed to be. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that I th that would be useful is I think um, when says had the conversation about the connections, there just weren't there weren't there weren't other people to talk to about this experience. Um, 
Um, so one of the things that I've done is that we've noticed that, um, because I still check on the current uh, integrated biosciences students at Tuskegee, and we've noticed that they have been having some challenges um, just in connection, and a lot of it is because they are not connected. So I actually um, developed a series of kind of mentoring activities for them so that graduates of the IBS program, like myself, who are out in industry, out in out and working, can connect with them to talk to them about kind of like what you can do, where you can go, and just so you can have someone to talk to and, and say it gets better. And some of it is also still very much so, I can't remember the person that talked about it, but if you don't want to stay at the bench, who helps to guide your career path? That was very much a frustration of mine, is that I didn't want to stay at the bench, and everyone was like, oh, what do you want to do? Oh, okay. I don't know what you want. okay then. And it was kind of like, well, you're on your own. And I don't think they meant it maliciously, but they literally had n no way to guide me. So I felt very confused and frustrated about kind of what to do next. And so um, I think that that is a lot of the frustration that we hope to alleviate with kind of the peer to peer. A mentoring program is I can talk to you if you want to do fellowships, if you want to work at a foundation, if you want to work at a government organization, I can help you navigate some of those pieces. Um, there were, like, I remember my, my PI is a lovely man, but he graduated and started working at Tuskegee. He never applied for another job. So how could he tell me how to apply? Uh, fill out a KSA or that's just not a skill set that he had but those are things I was trying to navigate and so n there was no encouragement in doing those things because there just wasn't that ability so I think um, for me reaching back and trying to to maybe supply some sort of guidance when you either want to go to the bench but maybe you don't even know other things that are out there, right? So a, a lot of times there are positions or fellowships or opportunities. So I'm like, even if you want to go back to the bench, just do something different for a year and see, see how you feel. And then you can go back and you're a little bit more informed because what we're seeing is a lot of the students that graduate from our programs, they don't, they don't leave. And, and I think you, you need to leave and come back, right? Leave, gain a lot of experience, and then bring all of that experience, all of those connections, all of those networks, and bring those back. And that makes you a richer commodity to the university versus you just stay there, and then maybe you just pick up a position. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I do think you need to go out and then come back and bring those connections back. Okay, this is great. Uh, do you want yeah. This is the only time I'll, I'm sure I'll have the mic. But um, two, two really kind of quick points with that. One is um, the idea of like PhD students going off and doing an internship was very foreign in our group um, or going off and doing like rotations. Um, it seemed like a kind of a tough thing, uh, yet our students found that valuable, and it kind of speaks to some of that. The other thing that I, I didn't really talk about was myself at all. Um, but I think one of the things that my presence in the program helped a little bit is that truly my work has been kind of all over the place and transdisciplinary and whatever buzzword you want to use for the year. And that's the kind of thing that people told me as a junior faculty, like, you're never going to get tenure. You're never going to be able to can remain in academics unless you start playing by the rules of the structure. And, and the truth is, for the graduate students mostly, I'm speaking now at this point, I did get tenure. I was advanced full professor. It was fine. It just people were saying to me, oh, you're taking a big risk by, you know, and I just kept saying, ask good questions, answer them well, and you'll be fine. And so um, there is that opportunity, too, for students who like, you know, to pull different things together. You like this kind of world and you like academics. You actually can do both. You don't have to go off to other creative environments. Um, you can, and that's great, too. But, um, but I think it's worth saying for those, for those of you who are thinking about where you're going next. 